Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to be here and to uh, share with you some of my research into uh, Wahhabism and the Sunni Jihadi movement, which, as you were told, are the two subjects that my work is currently focused on. Uh, I should perhaps begin by just saying a quick word about each of these two terms, which I don't assume anyone is necessarily familiar with. So Wahhabism, I don't want to get ahead of myself, is an Islamic revivalist movement that emerges in the mid 18th century in the Arabian Peninsula. It was founded by a controversial preacher named Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, hence the name given to it by its enemies, who considered it to be a dangerous heresy. And the gist of Wahhabism was that Islam had been corrupted by polytheistic accretions and that it needed to be restored to its true monotheistic origins. And another thing about Wahhabism that you may know is that it has a long-standing relationship with the House of Saud, the dynasty that rules the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and which until very recently adhered to a version of Wahhabism as its state religion. The Sunni Jihadi movement is of much more recent vintage. This is the ideological movement associated with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, or ISIS. Other names for it include Jihadi Salafism or Jihadism, just for short. The movement take, uh, takes form beginning in the 1960s and 1970s in the Arab world with the aim of overthrowing the secular regimes of the Middle East and replacing them with Islamic states and ultimately with a unitary state known as the Caliphate. And as you are probably aware, in 2014, ISIS or the Islamic State claimed to have restored that Caliphate. And it continues to say that it is, in fact, uh, representing the new and restored Caliphate. Now, the way that these two movements, Wahhabism and Jihadism, are related is that the Jihadi movement over the last several decades has sought to root itself ideologically in the Wahhabi heritage. So in their essays and books, the self-styled scholars of the Jihadi movement appeal to Wahhabi concepts and authorities in making the case for revolutionary Jihad. And this appeal is especially pronounced in the case of the Islamic State, which will even style itself a kind of extension of the original Wahhabi mission begun in the 1740s. In other words, then, the jihadi movement, it appropriated the heritage of Wahhabism such that it sees itself as the continuation of something that began in the mid-18th century. Um, now, it's often said by our political leaders and others that jihadism, that radical Islam, is a perversion of Islam. This is something that President Bush and President Obama especially were fond of saying. And I don't necessarily wish to contest that characterization, for jihadism is indeed a fringe movement with a minuscule following in the, among the billion uh, Muslims in the world. But I do think it's important uh, to understand that the movement has historical and doctrinal antecedents and that these are worth taking seriously. And that is what I hope to demonstrate to you today. Jihadism may well be a perversion of Islam, but I hope you'll see that it rests on what could be seen as an earlier perversion of Islam, which may be, which is Wahhabism. And as, you'll, as I will show you shortly, um, many people in the Islamic world, so you, if you understand ISIS today, and you understand that the vast majority of the world's Muslims see it to be a terrible heresy, uh, that has nothing to do with the religion. That's the same approach that most of the world's Muslims took to Wahhabism when it emerged in the mid-18th century. And both of them became state-building projects. So now let me turn to Wahhabism itself. So Wahhabism, as I mentioned before, was started by a man named Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. We have no pictures of any, or anything like this. We do have his writings, but uh, the printing press didn't come to the Arabian Peninsula until the early 20th century, which is worth bearing in mind. So a lot of my research is done in manuscripts. He lived in an area called Nejd here, um, in the center of the Arabian Peninsula, which was a sparsely populated desert region with a smattering of oasis towns. And in, in, importantly, and in contrast, I think, with what we'll hear from our next speaker, he belonged to the towns. He was a man who hated the Bedouin and saw the Bedouin to be not Muslims at all. Um, he began preaching his controversial doctrine in the year 1741, which may be of interest to you because that's just two years before the founding of the American Philosophical Society. And it's funny, when I uh, taught and studied at Princeton, we used to say that Wahhabism began at the time that Princeton was founded, in 1745. So um, it's interesting how many institutions uh, 
learned institutions on the East Coast were founded around the same time as Wahhabism. But I, I assure you, Mohammed bin Abdul Wahab would not have approved of anything that's happened here. Um, so the doctrine that he preached was one of strict monotheism, or in Arabic, tawhid. And it was a reaction to what he perceived as widespread saint veneration, or worship. What is sometimes called in the academic literature, the cult of saints. These were practices whereby worshipers would visit the grave sites of holy men and prophets and supplicate to them, asking for worldly favors or intercession with God on the day of judgment. And they were a feature of, the, of, of mainstream Islam in Arabia and beyond uh, and throughout the Islamic world. But for Ibn Abdul Wahhab, all of this was awful polytheism, or what he called shirk in Arabic. He considered, therefore, the majority of professed Muslims to be, in fact, polytheists on account of the popularity of the cult of saints, uh, which was, as you can imagine, a highly provocative contention, as, and, and one that earned him the opprobrium of his fellow Muslim scholars in the surrounding region, some of whom called him crazy and even called for his head. And this was before the movement was really a militant movement. So this, for instance, is an image of one of the earliest refutations of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, which happens to be held at Princeton University, where I did my doctoral work. It was written in 1743 by a scholar in Mecca who writes, if he is insane, he should be imprisoned, beaten, and treated with medication for insanity. If he does not change, then it has become clear that he is a misled misleader. Mudil Mudal, who should be killed after being publicly denounced so as to deter the likes of him. If my hands could reach him, I would kill him myself. So the men of religion in nearby lands considered him to be a pretty dangerous, gang, a pretty dangerous guy and one who really needed to be stopped. Um, more interesting are, however, the refutations that we have that preserve some of the writings of Ibn Abdul Wahhab and that allow us to see exactly what he was preaching at a particular time. Because interestingly, this refutational tradition involves the reproduction of the entirety of your opponent's words. So this is the only way that we are able to date some of Ibn Abdul Wahhab's own writings. So this is a, a manuscript that is in Baghdad and I got through a contact there, and it is written by a man in Basra in southern Iraq in 1742 um, who does not like Ibn Abdul Wahhab at all. Um, significantly, what we see Ibn Abdul Wahhab doing in the epistle is not only criticizing the cult of saints and calling it polytheism, but also demanding that his followers confront the so-called polytheists. So after he outlines his position on monotheism, on tawhid, he says to his intended convert, do not think that if you say this is the truth, I follow it and I eschew all else, but I will not confront them, that is the polytheists, and I will say nothing about them. Do not think that that will profit you. Rather, it is necessary to hate them, to hate those whom they love, to revile them and to show them enmity. Um, <laughs> in other words, then, it's, it's not enough for you to just agree with me that the cult of saints is polytheism and that what I say is monotheism is true, but you have to, um, but you have to demonstrate your belief in this by showing hatred and enmity to the polytheists. It, rather intuitive. Um, in addition, however, he also uh, made it a requirement for believers to engage in excommunication, or what is known as tekfir in Arabic, of the alleged polytheist. So this is from another epistle of his from around the same time, uh, one that is very commonly cited in, in the jihadi world today. He writes, whoever does not excommunicate, that is engage in tekfir, of the polytheists or has doubts about their unbelief or affirms the truth of their doctrine is an unbeliever by consensus. And as we'll see, this line is a big deal today in, in the uh, internal contest in the Islamic State. So the, the doctrine of Wahhabism, to sum it up, uh, it was premised on two things. One was an exclusivist understanding of the faith, whereby most professed Muslims were held to be beyond the pale. And the second was a requirement for a kind of activism that involved confronting and excommunicating the opponents of Wahhabism. And also later, this involved uh, fighting them in jihad, or religious war. And that jihad began in about 1745, when Ibn Abdul Wahhab formed an alliance with a local chieftain named Muhammad ibn Saud, who was the leader of one of the 
oasis towns in Nejd, in Central Arabia. And he adopted Wahhabism as the ideology of state, and that state, which came to be known as the first Saudi state, began to grow on the basis of waging jihad against polytheists. Uh, and here is a depiction of the state in about 1765. But by the early 1800s, uh, the first Saudi state had expanded across Arabia. It conquered Mecca and Medina in the west, the two holiest cities in Islam, and it was knocking on the door of Iraq and Syria further north. Um, and if you look at some of the letters that were sent by the leaders of the Islamic, I'm sorry, not the Islamic state, the first Saudi state, uh, to the Ottoman governors of Baghdad and Damascus in the early 1800s, you find that they were accusing the, the Ottomans of being polytheists, and they were threatening to invade and conquer those lands. And there were, in fact, worries among European observers who lived in these areas that the Wahhabis were on their doorstep. Um, it was not to be, however, because the Ottoman Empire, the much bigger uh, empire, much bigger than the Saudi state, at that time decided to send an army into Arabia to destroy the first Saudi state. And it did that in 1818 after a long campaign, and they raised the capital there to the ground and killed and deported many of the Saudi and Wahhabi leaders. And yet, as in many insurgencies, they were not able to stamp out the problem entirely. The Saudi Wahhabi project continued. There was a second iteration of the Saudi state, which lasted from 1823 to 1891, and then a third Saudi state in, founded in 1902, and which a few decades later became known as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And the modern kingdom upheld much of the Wahhabi doctrine, as I've described it, but it also uh, kind of muted its more radical tendencies. It turned the movement into a quietist and statist religion, and it was in the, the corpus of classical Wahhabi texts where the more radical Wahhabi tradition lived on. And it was in these texts, uh, which, um, which are still widely available today, uh, which in the 1970s and 1980s, those who belonged to the jihadi movement started to recover. So men like Abu Muhammad al muqtasi here, who is a Jordanian, um, and who was born in the 1950s and is one of the self-styled religious scholars of the jihadi movement, he went to Saudi Arabia and he read the Wahhabi texts with great interest and quoted them extensively in books and essays. And if you see right there, this book above him is called The Splendid Pearls of Nejdi Responsha, which, which is the, the kind of the central um, collection, I mean, the main collection of classical Wahhabi texts. And what's pretty amazing is that his, his acolytes and others like him can often quote by page number and volume many of these texts in their sermons, uh, if you want to listen to those kinds of things. Um, in 1984, Abu Muhammad al muqtasi authored this book on the right, which is called Millet Ibrahim, the Religion of Abraham, which is little more than a collection, long uh, collection of Wahhabi uh, statements to the effect that we need to show enmity and hatred to, to the governments of our region. So where the Wahhabis had waged war against polytheism or shrine worship, the jihadis saw this, oh, we can change this and say we're waging war against the polytheism of democracy and man-made law. The basic Wahhabi concepts, excommunication, hatred, enmity, jihad, or transported into a new context. And over the coming decades, Wahhabism would achieve pride of place in jihadi ideology. Um, but Wahhabism, with its controversial call for excommunication of Muslims who are considered to be flawed Muslims uh, was, of course, inherently divisive. And even in the jihadi movement, beginning in the 80s and 90s, you saw the development of an ideological divide in the movement between those who had a more theologically hardline orientation and those who were relatively of more moderate. Uh, for example, one issue was whether Shiite Muslims are to be considered uh, kuffar or unbelievers. So in Wahhabi doctrine, traditionally, yes, they are, and they can be killed and fought. Um, but groups like Al-Qaeda with a more pan-Islamist orientation didn't want to alienate the vast majority of the Islamic world by adopting those views. So you get these, these disputes that emerge. One of them emerged in early, uh, in, in about 2004 and 5, when Zarqawi, the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, decided to uh, 
uh, to start bombing Shiite shrines and, and Shia marketplaces, and the leaders of Al-Qaeda said, you can't do that because we, we excuse their, their unbelief and we consider them to be Muslims. Um, so that you can see this, the development um, of, this, of this divide. And, and that split really comes to the fore, however, uh, with the announcement of ISIS in April 2013, when ISIS broke from Al-Qaeda and build itself as the more hardline group, the more Wahhabi group, as against, in their view, the much more moderate Al-Qaeda. Um, it's always difficult using words like extremist and moderate to differentiate Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And I, I've been accused of all sorts of things, but you get the point is it's all relative. They're all extremists, but there's, there are gradations. Um, so here is the former speaker of ISIS, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, uh, calling out the leadership of Al-Qaeda for not being strict enough in its theology and for failing to excommunicate the Iranian Shiite regime and the secular Egyptian army. We call on you to correct your methodology by clearly pronouncing tekfir on the filthy rejectionist polytheists, those are the Shia, and, and clearly declaring the apostasy of the Egyptian army. Uh, so the split today between ISIS and Al-Qaeda is, to a large extent, in my opinion, an ideological one that has its roots in differences over the interpretation of Wahhabism. And that's one reason why I think this is a split that is likely to endure. Um, Al-Qaeda calls itself, I mean, excuse me, Al-Qaeda calls ISIS extremists and tekfiris, where ISIS calls Al-Qaeda morjaites or postponers because they fail to pronounce tekfir on their opponents. Another illustration of the Islamic State's devotion to Wahhabism is seen in the number of classical Wahhabi texts that it has published, uh, particularly at the time that it held the, um, its territorial caliphate from Iraq to Syria. So these are just a few examples of the covers of those books, which are the standard texts, just the standard texts of the Wahhabi canon. And in the introductions to these, some of the times the editor will argue that the Islamic State is really the true heir to the Wahhabi tradition and an extension of what Ibn Abd al-Wahhab started in the mid uh, 18th century. Um, similarly, you find many in the Islamic State comparing the Islamic State to the first Saudi state. So this is an excerpt from an, inter an internal memo that was leaked online. Uh, and the author describes the reasons for why they decided to publish these Wahhabi texts. And he says, the caliphate, that is ISIS, is living a reality similar to the reality faced by the first Saudi state which emerged in the Arabian Peninsula in a sea of polytheism and unbelief and which was attacked because it was renewing monotheism and the prophetic tradition. The reality faced by the early leaders of the Nejdi mission, that is Wahhabism, resembles what we are living through. But once again, the ideas in these books had another divisive effect, as in jihadism more generally, and the Islamic State itself there developed an ideological rift between rival camps of relatively more extremist and relatively more moderate jihadis. And from 2014 onward, they were engaged in an internal power struggle. Much of the debate, as I mentioned before, or alluded to before, had to do with the requirement, as outlined by Ibn Abd al-Wahhab, about uh, the, the requirement for engaging in tech fear or excommunication of those considered to be unbelievers. So the uber extremist faction, for example, uh, wanting to enforce the requirement uh, would argue that those living outside the boundaries of the caliphate were not necessarily to be considered Muslims. Um, while those in the more moderate camp said, actually, by default, we need to consider them Muslims or we'll alienate everybody. Um, you guys are crazy. And <laughs> but it was the crazies, who, the relative extremists, who ended up getting the upper hand. And in May 2017, they issued a communique declaring tech fear or excommunication to be, quote unquote, one of the manifest principles of the religion, which essentially was to say that there is no excuse for failing to engage in tech fear, and that those who fail to engage in tech fear are themselves to be subject to tech fear, which you know, really roiled the relative moderates who decided this is insane, and they wrote a number of refutations, long refutations that were leaked online and read by people like me, and that were addressed to the caliph himself. Um, that the authors of many of these texts were killed very, very soon after writing these texts. The author of this one on the left is a Bahraini named Turki al-Bin Ali, and he died just about two weeks after he wrote it. Um, he was imprisoned by the Islamic State. Not, not him. He was actually killed uh, in an airstrike on a convoy. Uh, 
it gets confusing, there's so many people. Um, but the author of, of, of this one, uh, or that one in the middle, he did die a as a prisoner. Um, so with all the opposition to Baghdadi, the caliph decided, okay, I'm going to withdraw the memorandum, and he replaced it with another audio series on Tech Fear, which was a bit more moderate. However, the rift did not end, and the complaints continued about the domination of the extremists, until finally, in 20, early 2019, the scholarly class in ISIS, that is the relative moderates, decided to, to re retract the oath of allegiance to the caliph, and essentially to say, ISIS is, is no good. And so they have defected from the group. Um, and there are estimates, it's, not, it's difficult to say how many uh, defected, but it's estimated that there were hundreds, if not more, and that hundreds were killed as part of, of this dispute. So as the Islamic State was being beaten back on the ground in 2017, 2019, it was also, to some extent, destroying itself from within, consumed by these ideological disagreements of, over Wahhabism. So you can see why, in the title, I argue that Wahhabism is a divisive tradition. Um, and one could even argue that on account of the ideology of jihadism being infused with Wahhabism, jihadism is, is in a way its own worst enemy. It's just too prone to these, these kinds of fissures. And in conclusion, I hope that this is to show that the study of militant groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, um, in the study of these groups, the study of ideas has an important and clarifying role as well. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Doug Massey from Princeton. Hi. Um, fellow Princetonian. Uh, could you speak on the role of the Saudi state in a, a evangelizing Wahhabism through the madrasa system that it was funding? Basically, my understanding is they cut a deal where the Wahhabis wouldn't criticize the Saudi state, in return for which the Saudi state would support their evangelist activities to create schools all over the, uh, yeah. the Muslim world. Is that an accurate portrayal? Uh, that's relatively accurate, I would say. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the, when, when oil was discovered in, in Saudi Arabia, and all of a sudden, the government was able to establish real authority over the country, uh, the, and the Saudis, they didn't want the religious establishment to pay too much attention to them, they decided to, to fund Wahhabism around, around the world. And that uh, activity was increased after 1979 with the siege of Mecca by some of the Wahhabi radicals in the kingdom. Uh, so there was, to some extent, a kind of trade-off, you could say, between, uh, between, the, um, be between the government and the scholars, whereby the scholars were able to, to kind of have control over the social sphere and also export their, their version of the faith. Um, but I would argue that it is a slightly toned down version of the faith. It's not the kind of Wahhabism that the Wahhabi state, that the Saudi, third Saudi state, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has promoted, even since the 1930s, is not nearly as radical as, as the one that I discussed in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, of course, all of the, the ideas are still there, but their, their implications aren't, aren't quite borne out. Uh, and then today, to bring it to the current, uh, to our current state of affairs, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, has really tried to, uh, to cut away at the scholars' authority and their power. And this is difficult to, to confirm, but I hear from a lot of people uh, who I trust that the government has taken steps to stop the exportation of Wahhabism to the kind of madrasas that you talked about. The balcony. In the balcony. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, so what became of the leader and originator of Wahhabism? Did he live his life in enmity toward his enemies? Did he reform? Did he get assassinated? What, what became of him? Yeah, he uh, lived a pretty long life. I actually noticed, uh, doing some research on the American Philosophical Society, that he was a contemporary of Benjamin Franklin's and died around the same year. He died in 1792, uh, a pretty old man, and uh, around about the age of 90. Um, so he was very successful. He is alleged to have gone into something of a retirement. Um, so he stopped writing, but he continued to, to, to instruct the next generation of Wahhabi scholars. Um, so that, that's what happened. Um, um, Howard Gardner from, from Cambridge. Um, for those of us who, for whom this is completely new, could you say a word about the extent to which the differences are strictly within religious doctrine as opposed or strictly about power, 
as opposed to other ideas where people might really disagree, but they aren't particularly religious. Um, they're not doctrinal, as it were. Right. That's an important question. Not, not all of the people uh, who are party to these debates are really um, committed to one doctrinal position or another. And this does come up sometimes. There will be people who say, you know, who cares about these petty little disputes? Um, but at the same time, a lot of the people clearly do. Um, so when you study groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, it's not like once you f look at their internal communications, they stop talking about religion and it's all about power. Uh, the talk about religion is continued and it's pronounced. Um, these people, by and large, are, are very committed uh, believers uh, to you know, one version of Islam or another. Um, so for, I mean, there is a theory that a number of the people at the top, at the helm of the Islamic State, wanted to liquidate both parties to this dispute because they thought that we can't get back to you know, just being a caliphate until we have killed the crazies on both sides. <laughs> And that is, I don't know if this is true. Um, another problem with studying these groups in real time is that they are secretive and we don't know everything. Um, and a lot of people claim to. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> yeah. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very, very much. Thank you.